well, I have taken part in uh, MOG programs earlier too, at least once, uh, when I had given a talk on poetry and resistance, if I remember right. Um, and and, and Subodh has been a long time friend, a, almost uh, it's a family friend. So it's always a pleasure to, to be here and we have also, I find, a lot of Malayalis around, which is again <laughs> a pleasure. Uh, and, and, and we have people who love and care for poetry. So it's a pleasure to be reading some of the translations of my poems here. In the evening, there is a program with the Malayalis where the program itself will be in Malayalam. I will be speaking a little about poetry and then interacting with the audience. Uh, these, these, these are actually translations uh, of my poetry, originally written in Malayalam, uh, done by myself. You know, translations always uh, uh, carry some kind of a transmission loss. But that is not to say that the originals are much better, but uh, uh, certainly translations, uh, uh, well, something is lost. Uh, most probably the sound of the language is the first thing to be lost in translation because I have been uh, a translator as well as a poet all along, at least for more than 50 years, translating from Hindi into English, Hindi into Malayalam, Malayalam into English, uh, not only my poetry, but uh, poetry by younger people. Not only contemporary poetry, but uh, parts of Ramayana and uh, you know, various uh, various kinds of texts I have done, and I know how each one uh, has a different kind of demand on the translator. Uh, so I have tried to to be. I have treated my own poems like somebody else's poems while translating. That is, I have not taken any kind of uh, extra freedom uh, with the original text while translating. I have tried to be as faithful as possible. Uh, because I have not made adjustments to make it uh, sound English or look English. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I believe they retain something of the original, the, the, the mood, the feeling, the thought, uh, the, the outlook. So something I hope I have been able to bring into the translations of my poetry and that's why uh, I'm reading them with some kind of a confidence, even though reading translations is not necessarily an act, uh, you know, that can be done confidently. Uh, so uh, now that uh, it is the 150th of Gandhi and uh, uh, Moog had quite a few programs on Gandhi and, and I think uh, it's an ongoing series on Gandhi, I thought I, I will begin with, uh, you know, two or three uh, poems on Gandhi. I actually am planning a whole series on Gandhi uh, while uh, I have, uh, uh, th th these, these poems were not written as part of a series but somehow I find myself writing a poem on Gandhi every two years or something, I mean in the recent years. So I'll be reading uh, three or four of them and then reading, you know, other, other, other poems so that uh, I think um, it's only proper that I begin with uh, uh, two or three pieces on Gandhi <coughs> or around Gandhi. One of my earliest poems on Gandhi, um, uh, relate, um, um, it's about the relationship between Gandhi and poetry. This is something I have often thought of uh, because Gandhi was not supposed to be, uh, or at least uh, uh, in, in the popular image, uh, Gandhi is not very close to poetry. Uh, even though Gandhi has said that uh, uh, my life is an art. And, and if you look at it that way, it's quite possible that Gandhi was a lover of poetry. And Gandhi, of course, we know that Gandhi, uh, um, you know, was a great uh, admirer of Kabir and of Narasi Mehta and quite a few of the uh, Bhakti poets and some of the Sufi poets uh, uh, to whose tradition he also belongs, I mean, in terms of thought and outlook. I have always felt, uh, you know, he's somebody who, I mean, who has been impacted a lot by you know, um, people like Kabir, uh, who who did not believe in religion in its uh, very established and traditional sense, but who were very deeply spiritual. So we have Sri Narayana Guru in Kerala, for example, who also belongs to that kind of a tradition. He was a poet as well as a philosopher. And uh, Gandhi, to me, belongs to that tradition of uh, uh, spirituality, which is not confined to any uh, uh, very insular concept of uh, religion, any narrow concept of religion. And, uh, and that is what also in some sense relates him to the art of poetry because, uh, because poetry is something that transcends all kinds of divisions and uh, I believe its language is universal, whatever the language in which it is written. Uh, uh, and uh, that's why I, uh, well, um, that is some kind of a, an introduction to my poem on Gandhi and poetry, which I'll read now. To 
towards the end of the poem there is an expression uh, you know about uh, there is a, there is a line where gandhi speaks of sanskrit and asking people uh, not to speak sanskrit uh, i have a request that you should not take it literally i am a, i am a great admirer of the great sanskrit works you know but here uh, because it is in it, uh, it was originally in malayalam and in malayalam uh, you know there when somebody says something that you don't understand you say oh you are speaking sanskrit very much like in english they say it is greek to me so they say it is sanskrit to me and uh, i have used that i made use of that uh, uh, um, that that kind of a um, an, an everyday usage from malayalam uh, that's what i have done uh, even though yes as i said i read sanskrit classics and philosophy and poetry and enjoyed it thoroughly well <coughs> Gandhi and poetry One day a lean poem reached Gandhi's ashram to have a glimpse of the man Gandhi spinning away his thread towards Ram took no notice of the poem waiting at the door ashamed as he was no pajan the poem cleared his throat and gandhi looked at him sideways through those glasses that had seen hell have you ever spun thread he asked ever pulled a scavenger's cart ever stood the smoke of an early morning kitchen have you ever starved the poem said there is a there is a kind of indirect reference to vyasa and valmiki here even though the lines can stand independently without those references i was born in the woods in a hunter's mouth a fisherman brought me up in his hamlet you know vyasa was a was a fisher woman's son the poem said i was born in the woods in a hunter's mouth a fisherman brought me up in his hamlet yet i know no work i only sing first i sang in the courts then i was plump and handsome but i am on the streets now half starved that's better gandhi said with a sly smell a uh, sly smile but you must give up this habit of speaking in sanskrit at times go to the fields listen to the peasant speech the poem turned into a grain and lay waiting in in the fields for the tiller to come and upturn the virgin soil moist with the new rain that is the first poem of gandhi <laughs> i read two two more poems on gandhi and and another which has something to do with gandhi and then then go ahead <coughs> this is uh, a kind of conversation between gandhi and uh, a tree it's called gandhi and the tree <clears throat> this is supposed to be happening towards the end of gandhi's life gandhi and the tree gandhi was walking in the sun that had survived naukhali gandhi was walking in the sun that had survived naukhali come have some rest gandhi turned back it was a shady tree you it is not yet time for me to rest replied gandhi the tree complained the world is in a hurry I have grown old. No more do I flower nor bear fruit. Even birds have abandoned me. Don't worry, Gandhi said. You are waiting for the axe and I for the bullet. <coughs> Don't say that. The tree was in agony. Someone will need that shade. The memory of spring escaped the tree as a sigh pray said gandhi if you don't stop 
I will have to walk with you now. The tree now began to walk with Gandhi. A wind blew. A bird flew to the tree. See, I am in bloom again. The tree laughed with white flowers. You have started walking? Then I can cease. Gandhi's blood whispered as it gushed out like a prayer for every being. See, my flowers are growing red, cried out the emancipated tree. Three birds that had dreamt of fruits came flying from the east. Three birds that had dreamt of fruits came flying from the east. The same east from where the wise men had come. <laughs> There is a more recent poem, a simple one, called the, called Salt. It was written after a Dandi march some of us had undertaken in, in, the, in the, I mean, uh, on the last anniversary of the Dandi march. <coughs> salt. Ninety years ago, we extracted from the sweat of the ocean's ceaseless waves a handful of salt, a blossom of tender white in a lean raised hand. One hand suddenly turned into 6,000 manacled ones. Millions of fists raised against an empire where the sun never set. From that day, truth in our land came to be called imprisoned salt. Ram, Allah, Khuda, Messiah, that salt was everything to us. The prophetess who emerged from the sea form and arrived in the kitchen, the white-winged angel, the eternal savior of our dreams, a handful of liberty, a handful of equality, a handful of love, a handful of kindness, a Buddha of salt. Today, once again, we raise a flag of white salt in the background of the ocean's dark turquoise blue, the fleeting vision of dark-haired freedom slipping off from our little hands, the snowy elaboration of fair equality that will keen our that that we still keen our ears for. Elaboration here is used in the sense in which it is, it is used in music actually. The snowy elaboration, raga vistaram, we say raga, yeah, raga. The snowy elaboration of fair equality that we still keen our ears for. A calloused hand with the scent of sweat our flesh and tears have. A handful of the dark edged salt of justice studded with the sand grains of rebellion that Gandhi had raised in Dundee 90 years ago. There is another uh, rather recent poem where Gandhi just appears at the end, but but Gandhi is there somewhere. Because whenever I imagine Gandhi, I imagine him, you know, walking, walking, walking very fast. And the poem is called Walk, Walk. It is, it is something like a rap in, in Malayalam too. Walk, Walk. Walk, 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 walk together, walk with the questions yet to find an answer, walk with the song without a roof, walk with the pitcher whose river has vanished, walk with the last leaf of the felled tree, 
walk with the consonants of the proscribed poem, walk with the blood from the stab wound. Read the lines again a little faster. Walk, walk, walk together, walk with the questions yet to find an answer, walk with a song without a roof, walk with the pitcher whose river has vanished, walk with the last leaf of the felled tree, walk with the consonants of the proscribed poem, walk with the blood from the stab wound, walk, walk along the shade between the hair and the grass, through the fire between the word and its meaning, walk in red with the sun's dreams, walk in black with the moon's solitude, walk again against the wind's direction, walk across the water's flow. Walk, walk along the shade between the hair and the green, through the fire between the word and the meaning, walk in red with the sun's dreams, walk in black with the moon's solitude, walk against the wind's direction, walk across the water's flow. Walk, walk from death to life with a palette of colors. You are the sculptor and you the sculpture. Walk, walk from death to life with a palette of colors. You are the sculptor and you the sculpture. Stop and you will fall. Walk without a pause. Like the Buddha leaving the palace. Like Christ leaving for Calvary. Like Gandhi marching to Dandi. Walk on. Never look back. Walk. Stop and you will fall. Walk without a pause like the Buddha leaving the palace, like Christ leaving for Calvary, like Gandhi marching to Dandi. Walk on, never looking back. Walk, walk, walk. Well, these are about uh, the, po <laughs> the poems on Gandhi. I'll come back with more poems later. <laughs> I'll read a few of the more recent poems and then maybe go back to some older ones. Women. One woman walks in a hurry, sobbing, a house with faded paint on her head. One woman goes on waiting at a railway station where no train stops. One woman with a halo of glowworms walks in the dark towards the stars. One woman makes sure her wings are in place before she launches herself into a flight. One woman steps into a cornfield in drought with a rain cloud on her shoulder. One woman sings a song, making a fruit tree in autumn burst into blossoms. One woman glints like a spark of fire in the ashes of her little house set on fire. One woman scoops up her baby and flees to the border, watching a fighter jet swoop down. One woman sharpens the letters of the alphabet and pulls out the fangs of the enveloping dark. One woman closes the door of her house with a bang, walks out and hums a medley on the street. One woman looks at the image of Jesus on the cross and yells in agony, Son, my darling son. One woman leaves her man on the panel in Khajuraho and finds her pleasure herself. One woman, her muscles hardening as I look on, turns into a goddess of iron and fire. One woman sharpens her sickle again and again, rubbing it against a rock in a forest stream. One woman climbs up a tank and offers flowers to soldiers with the moon's smile. A sight we saw in, in the Arab Spring. One woman climbs up a tank and offers flowers to soldiers with the moon's smile. One woman, tired of her life on earth, leaves for space in a vehicle made of her own bones. One man stands aghast on the roadside, too scared to cross the road.
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> she inside me. Uh, because I have somehow always believed all human beings are bisexual in the sense there is a woman inside a man and a man inside a woman. If at all we need the division, um, but for biological reasons. Uh, so I, in, in this is very true that as a, as a baby I had imagined, as a child I had imagined myself to be a girl and I used to look into the mirror, you know, adorn myself and, and dance before the mirror. So it is about that she inside me, she inside me. As a child, I used to dance in front of the mirror in skirt and bangles. That girl is still dancing inside me. I conceal her with my hair, man's voice and attire. But at times she leaps out, breaking every shell, longing to be addressed as mother and sister and daughter, tempting me to befriend women more than men, leaving me wondering whether what I feel towards some men is just to friendship or intimate love, being persecuted, resisting, taking over the anger and tears of child brides, widows, prostitutes and slain women and cursing the world of men. I would have danced in squares had I not been scared of men's stoning. Abuse me, saying, I am neither man nor woman. I reject gender. God doesn't have one. But I refuse to be used as a cover for a coward to kill an old man. Uh, you know, that this is a reference to a uh, Mahabharata story where Arjuna in Mahabharata, you know, um, he, he is supposed to be a hero but he hides behind Shikhandi in order to kill Bhishma. Uh, that is the reference there. But I refuse to be used as a cover for a coward to kill an old man. <laughs> Let me see what I have. Between 70 and 75, it's about old age. There is a dark place between 70 and 75. Broad like memory, deep like death. Those trapped there have no return. They roam about in the childhood bushes or fall headlong into the well of decrepitude. Be warned, if those between 70 and 75 behave like the young. Be warned, if those between 70 and 75 behave like the young, for they are young. <laughs> they can love, can dance to music, and if need be, even lead a war or a revolution. In fact, they are not dead like many young are. Those between 70 and 75 may suffer from delusions. At times they want a horse ride. At times want to fly above oceans and mountains on the back of an eagle. Wander along deserts looking for water that is not there. Stand naked in the rain or read a poem no one has written yet. There are times when they feel history is retracing its steps and feel like crying aloud, screaming almost. The solitude of those between 70 and 75 is sepia. I have a lot to do with painting as you can see in my poem. <laughs> like some early morning dreams or like the friendships in old albums. When they laugh, Sunlight retreats into village lanes. Their sweat smells soft like, uh, like sesame flowers. Their walk is like the descending scale of Saveri, Eragas, you know. And their lilting speech is littered with gamakas. You wonder why? This is all about men. Yes, women do not pass at all 
between 70 and 75. Invisible to us, they just glide along on a tender rainbow of affection with the soft feet of fairies, fragrant like heaven, and the smile of oleanders, an invitation to salvation. Symmetry. I live inside the cold, fetid, mossy language of a symmetry. I live inside the cold, fetid, mossy language of a symmetry. Fresh, dark, dead bodies arrive here every day. At night, they slightly raise their heads, unsure they are dead like the dead. Darkness will scare some whose memory is still alive. The corpses of the lynched at times turn to the other side, groaning as if their bones on one side ache still. The corpses of the lynched at times turn to the other side, groaning as if their bones on one side ache still. Some eye sockets filled with tears, thinking of their children who have abandoned them. It is from those sockets that tulips spring in the cemetery. The women, raped and killed, don't even look at the dead men, afraid they, they will turn them into hard rocks with no springs within. It is the voice the dead hear that the living call silence. And the light they see, night. Leaves murmur is their speech. The scent of flowers and the chirping of birds frighten them. They have seen fangs on roses and blood on birds' beaks. They feel the laughter of the living is the downpour that drowns them. Mushrooms are born from them. But they are far from edible. Don't insist that the dead should respond to everything around them. Don't approach them with your microphones. They fear news. The only hope of my rotting patriotic flesh is the happy day when I too will be lifeless like them. Let no one pray for my survival. For death frees us from every border. It is truly international. This cemetery is my motherland. The only country shaped like a skull. Whose national flag is black. And whose national anthem is but an endless scream. Well, was it too political? <laughs> <laughs> A house called Soro. Soro is also a very recent poem. Soro is a house. Its walls painted yellow and ceiling green with fungus. It has many rooms from melancholy and pain to anguish and depression. Darkness and chill go on growing as one moves from room to room. There are doors from one room to another, like from autumn to winter. But there are no windows, only small casements for size to pass. The last room opens to a deep well. Even the screams of those who step out of its door never come out. Some are temporary residents in this house, but some stay there forever until a catastrophe liberates them into eternal darkness. Those who dwell there do not even know there is a garden of pleasure outside it. The loud laughter 
and the hisses of kisses from the garden strike those yellow doors shatter and fall on the moist earth below sweet scents return to their sources fluttering their spotted wings scared of the darkness within those hurrying along the road in front must have sometimes had a glimpse of that house but those people struggling to survive hardly find time to stay there the fairies guarding that house at times invite me too to stay there but the choked screams i had heard from the neighboring rooms and a chewed bones flung from them during my short stay there in the past keep dissuading me even my language had left me then silence covered me like a termite's mound and when i broke out of it there were three flags in my hand one green one blue one red <laughs> actually about uh, a small period of depression i passed through when i was very young when i could not write even a line of poetry when i took to painting actually too as a as a solace <coughs> yeah. go to some older one uh, maybe not very old again can tell me when to wear 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 any time i can <laughs> uh, birds come after me because there is also an interact short interaction yeah, after this yeah fine birds come after me birds come after me as if i were a walking tree i spread my crown for them like the mushroom in the russian children's tale growing ever wider to shelter birds and beasts from rain i grow many hands from the legs for the parrots from the hip for crows from the belly and the back for the cranes eagles kingfishers and owls and tiny tugs for sparrows and tree parrots they fruit my head opens out like a tree top and bats hang from them undefined between birdness and beastliness my hairs blossom butterflies looking for honey surround my head like a halo as i watch each bird turns into a letter an alphabet of birds the wind passes between them they make many noises order themselves into lines resound with suggestions change places combine to become something else sing and tell stories vanished hills and forests crowd their memory dried up pools and streams roofs and telephone cables with screams passing through them and a scalding grammar of electric current a tree is a dictionary of leaves a tree is a dictionary of leaves my branches fill with poems my branches fill with poems the history of clouds well that is the title of a recent collection by hans magnus ensensberger the great german poet a history of clouds that's it Uh, I was in Shimla for a year. Peter knows they have knows it. <laughs> um, I was invited as a national fellow. I had two years, but after one year, I, when I felt that things were going to change, I just decided to leave. <laughs> uh, but but Shimla gave me um, five poems, out of which I'll read uh, two or three. Even even for those who are not familiar with Shimla, I think uh, they should it should be all right. Yeah. uh so sometimes my daughter came and stayed with me sometimes my wife sometimes my friends i walk inside a cloud i walk 
inside a cloud like the moon walks at times and at times michael jackson the valley's breeze caresses me like mother does at times at times a banana leaf i walk inside a cloud like the moon walks at times and at times michael jackson the valley's breeze caresses me like mother does at times and at times a banana leaf red flowers glisten on the hill top like desire does at times and and at uh, at times ashan well ashan is kumaran ashan who was a great uh, classical poet of malayalam i tread softly on the mountains every stone is a goddess while wondering if this violet flower would turn pink if i name it love there appears before me a dancing blue waterfall while wondering if this violet flower would turn pink if i name it love a dancing blue waterfall appears before me leela she says well well these are again characters of kumar and ashan in his famous poems leela she says i am the eternal beloved you are death i say a blue menaka she disappears into the mist with a scream only with a scream only a light remains it is because i write in that dim light that my poems become fireflies with a dark present and a bright future mm-hmm. now light may be that may be the beginning the genesis we always insisted was not this not this the story is yet to begin inside the cloud i am a yaksha you won't understand my language <laughs> Yeah. Quite a few Shimla poems. Well, me, uh, meditations, Shimla. This I came, this is a road act after coming back from Shimla when it had turned into memory. The monologue of the rock. Uh, it has two, three short poems inside. It's a sequence. Meditations, Shimla. The monologue of the rock. Once I was in the Pacific. among sea horses and coral reefs i was flung into the solitude of the shore as the continents began to drift apart the secrets of the earth lie engraved inside me layer upon layer wearing a flower i become goddess trampled upon i become the outcast woman when you sharpen your weapons on me i bleed i make no distinctions between love and prayer i have in me the sea and the sky beginning evolution end this umbrella cannot save you from my questions <laughs> the second is a very short one the flower i didn't know until yesterday the color of forgetting is violet and a man's tendency to name everything won't lead him anywhere <laughs> and the third poem snow i was the first born i covered all the languages letters were revealed as the sunbeams melted me it is the snow speaking i was the first born I covered all the languages letters were revealed as sunbeams melted me they turned into trees and bees thoughts and images i still stick to languages rendering them translucent <laughs> the way to heaven say again again shimla po don't look for the way to heaven in holy books ask instead the extinct plants and beasts 
Don't look for the way to heaven in holy books. Ask instead the extinct plants and bees. Orphans know it. Some sparrows too. The blind know it. Some sorrows too. It is not those in golden crowns that attain heaven, but the mad women with their with their tiaras of leaves and rags. Then too, the ripe jackfruit leaves, drunk with the evening breeze, playing their copper lair as they float and fly. Herds of clouds who have lost their shepherds, and dust soaring up from the waste heaps with dreams of gold. There is a coral tree on each step to heaven. With their thorns, they put a trial, they put to trial every century of man. There is a coral tree on each step to heaven. With their, with their thorns, they put to trial every century of man. Ask for the numbers of the slain and the maimed. Ask for the numbers of the slain and the maimed. We will have to leave behind all the beliefs we had held dear. Our answers are denied entry. On the way to heaven are the dense forests of questions we failed to ask on earth. On the way to heaven are the dense forests of the questions we failed to ask on earth. The, rush, the rushing cataracts of instincts we ruthlessly suppressed. Our silent selves that we had abandoned on the wayside to please somebody else. The, our abandoned selves, uh, our silent selves that we had abandoned on the wayside to please someone. Since there is no time here, our hair does not turn grey in its slow fire. Years do not leave their plow marks on our face. Knowledge does not weigh us down. No desire that hurts, no hope that scalds. There are no doors that are only half open, no complaining graveyards, no souls screaming for a body to be reborn. Here we take our baby steps against the dance of death. We boldly sing the songs we were scared to sing. Heaven is nothing but the life we have we, we never lived and we still are scared of living heaven is nothing but the life we never lived and are still scared of living kunguma gantham vidari chenganal chuttum chidari kattum tarunaruna chanchala suryan en kangalil undoru suryan Nilima imail nivarti, nila pili vidurti, nurtam cheyum pele vanila surian. En nastilundur surian, manja juala yuruki, maja yuruki yuruki, mangi tele moritiri manja surian. En nadilundur surian, punu bidichu velutum, kandima kudi narechum, kuni virachu vilartu talarnuru vella surian. En pranani lundur surian, marinampo le karutum, manjuganakutanutum, shuni de yude, gandam tavia, shamala surian. That is the time when I was writing very dark poems, like many of us did in the 60s, you know, under the influence of that uh, dark and morbid modernism. Uh, so this is also something of that. It's called Five Sons. Uh, this is just the meaning of it, actually. Uh, it's translated by Ayapa Panikar, uh, my late friend and uh, see, uh, my senior poet. In my blood is a son. He has tried to capture something of that music, but very, very hard. In my blood is a sun, a flaming, flickering sun, youthful and crimson, spreading a vermilion scent, scattering sparks around. In my eyes is a sun, a soft and azure sun, his eyelashes dipped in blue, prancing and dancing with his blue feathers outspread. In my bones is a sun, a little yellow sun, dim discovered and melting, the ma melting his marrow to pour forth a yellow glow. 
In my nerves is a sun, a pale white sun, a hunchback in tremor, his eyelids grey, his soul leprous blue, a leprous white. In my soul is a sun, a dark black sun, smelling of emptiness, cold as snow, dark as death. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> For the sound of it, yes, mainly. Yeah.